Welcome everyone. This is Professor Richard Holizak, and this is the Database Recovery Lecture. Just a quick preview. If you haven't viewed the Transaction Processing and Concurrency Control Lectures, those would be required viewing before you continue with this video. In the Transaction Processing video, we discuss the ACID properties, where a transaction is atomic, that it is a single, indivisible, logical unit of work. Transactions are consistency preserving, they move the database from one consistent state to another consistent state. Transactions are isolated, in that transactions are not aware of any other transaction until they commit. And the D stands for durable. Once a transaction commits, its work cannot be lost due to a future failure. Database recovery is all about supporting the durability property. And if you think about it, the durability property is an ironclad guarantee. It says as long as a transaction commits and finishes its work, none of the changes that that transaction made can be lost, even if the database crashes one second later. So let's see how a database management system can uphold the durability property. There are two types of failures that we consider in database recovery. In the first type of failure, we can call it a media or disk failure. This is where the data is destroyed. Something happens to the disk physically or electrically. Something happens to the disk controller that causes it to write bad data to the disk. It may also be a result of malicious action. Someone may come in and delete data. The bottom line is that for a media or disk failure, we assume the data is completely gone. The other type of failure that can occur is what's called a process failure. And here the database management system simply stops processing transactions. This could be due to a power failure or some process that is part of the database management system has crashed. Maybe the DBMS ran out of memory. Variety of different ways in which a process can fail. The assumption here is that the data on disk is okay but there may have been some transactions that were caught in the middle when there was a process failure. We will discuss how to recover the database from both of these types of failures. The database management system recovery subsystem is software that can detect failures and automatically recover. This is vastly preferred to a manual recovery effort where perhaps the users of the database have to go back and retype or re-enter all of the prior transactions due to some type of disk failure or process failure. So the DBMS's recovery subsystem is going to handle all of this recovery and will bring the database up to a state as close as possible to the time of failure. In order to do this, the database recovery subsystem maintains metadata about the current state of the database. Is the database up and running? Is it accepting transactions? Is it currently backing up data? Is it in the process of shutting down? In addition, the recovery subsystem keeps track of the backups. These are going to be copies of the data, where they are, and when those backups were taken. And the third item, the DBMS recovery subsystem will take care of transaction logs. Logs or journals are a record of what has happened in the database. Between these three pieces of metadata, the recovery subsystem can do its job to detect a failure and automatically recover the database. Here are these ways we support durability. Database backup that we just mentioned is a physical copy of the data made on a given date or time. And I'll describe a little more detail in the next few slides how we can actually take a backup and how we use the backup when we want to restore the data. I also mentioned a transaction log or a journal. This is a separate file or a series of files containing information about each transaction that is running. The transaction log consists of journal entries or log entries of the following types. The log records when a transaction starts, 
when a transaction writes to a data item like a record or a table, and when the transaction either commits or aborts. And we'll see some examples of these when I go through the transaction processing example later on. A third approach to support durability is called shadow paging. With shadow paging, each time a block or a page worth of records is modified, a copy is made. This is a good approach if the data in the database does not change very frequently, but it's simply not practical for most transaction processing databases as it takes up too much space. So for the remainder of this lecture, we'll focus on database backup and using a transaction log or journal. Speaking of database backup, how do we take a backup? The first thing we have to do is choose a particular day and or time when the backup can occur. We sometimes call this the backup window, or in some companies they will call this the maintenance window. Usually it's a time during the night when the number of transactions being processed tends to be low. If we think of a typical retail business, for example, that might be open from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., during the middle of the night, there probably aren't going to be any transactions. So this is a good time to take a backup. We can take a backup once a day, once a week, once a month. It really depends on the nature of the business and how quickly the data changes. Once we reach the backup window, the database sends a signal to stop accepting new transactions. Any transactions that are currently processing are allowed to finish. This then gives us a nice quiet moment in the database where no transactions are running. At that point, all of the data can be copied to a backup device. This backup device could be a second disk, or maybe a tape backup, or today, usually a backup is made into the cloud, something like Amazon's S3 service or Google Cloud Storage. This is a good way to make a backup of the data as well as get it off site so that if a data restoration needs to occur, it can be done from the cloud. There are a couple of different ways to take backups. In a full backup, we copy all of the data that's in the database. Every single record, every single table is copied to the backup. With an incremental backup, we only back up the data that has changed since the last time we did a backup. So for example, we could have a schedule where every Sunday night we do a full backup. All of the data gets copied over to our backup disk. On Monday through Friday, we do incremental backups. That is, we back up only the data that has changed since the last time we did a backup. Once we reach Sunday again, we do another full backup and then the cycle repeats. Once a backup is taken, the database can then signal it's okay to process transactions again. This can be set up automatically so that the database just knows the schedule of when it's supposed to take the backup, handles all of the work with the transactions, and then continues processing transactions afterwards. How do we restore from a database backup? Well, if there's a disk failure, the first thing someone has to do is replace the hard disks or make new hard disks available. Then we would restore the most recent full backup. If we're using incremental backups, then we'll restore the incremental backups that will get us as close as possible to the time of failure. For example, if we have a disk failure on Wednesday, we would restore our full backup from Sunday, then we would restore the incremental backup from Monday, and then finally the incremental backup from Tuesday. And that would bring the database up to date as closely as possible to when we had the failure. But what about the transactions that were processing Wednesday morning? We have all of the data restored as of Tuesday night, but what about all the transactions that happened on Wednesday? This is where transaction logs or journal comes in. A transaction log is a record of what happened in the database. Logs or journal entries consist of when the transaction begins, when the transaction writes to the database, and when the transaction commits or aborts. We can see from this SQL statement, we are updating the employee table. 
setting the salary equal to the current salary times 1.04, in other words, giving an employee a 4% raise. This is where a specific employee ID equals E101. So in our data, we know that Joe Smith is going to have their salary taken from 43,000 to 44,720. So that change from this transaction is made on disk. There's just one record that we need to update, that a change is made, and the record is, new record is written to the disk. In the journal, what we will see is this particular transaction started at a given time, and then when the transaction wrote to the database, we understand that it's the table, the key, which gives us the record that was changed, the column that was changed, the before image, which is the old value, and the after image, which is the new value. These two values are very important because they can allow us to either roll the database back to put the old value in place, or to roll the database forward to redo and put the new value in place, depending on the type of recovery we're going to do. And then, of course, we need to know whether the transaction committed or aborted. Usually, when a transaction like this runs in a real database, it actually happens in much less than a second. It's very important that the information be written to the log before the transaction is allowed to commit. And this is another way that the log or the journal helps support transaction durability. Now let's take a look at this familiar example. We went through this example in the concurrency control lecture. We have three transactions, transaction A, B, and C. Transaction A is going to read the raise rate, read Amy's salary, calculate a new salary for her, and then write it to the database. Transaction B is going to read the raise rate. It's going to read Bill's salary, apply the raise, and then write a new salary for Bill. Transaction C is going to read the raise rate, write a new raise rate to the database, then read Carl's salary, and then write the new Carl's salary to the database. So what I'd like to do is go through each of these steps and show you what the transaction log looks like. When the three transactions begin, transaction A, B, and C, we can see from the transaction log that we have a record. Basically, what time and the fact that each of these transactions has begun. Most of the steps that go on in the database that involve locking and reading are not going to be shown in the transaction log. The transaction log doesn't really care about when a transaction reads data. The transaction log is only concerned when the transaction writes data. So we can see in this next step, on step 13, transaction B wrote Bill's salary. We see that the journal entry shows us transaction B writing to Bill's salary, the before image, that is the old value was 38, and the after image is 39.9. So this is the way that our transaction log keeps a record of what exactly happened, in this case, to Bill's salary. In step 14, transaction A writes to Amy's salary. Again, we record the before image and the after image. Transaction B commits. It's very important that we know when a transaction commits. And in this step 22, we can see that transaction C wrote to the raise rate. The old value is 0.05 and the new value is 0.03. At this point, let's assume that our database crashes. We have a copy of our log, and depending on whether or not we have a disk failure or a process failure, we may or may not have our data. So let's see how we can recover from this particular failure. Again, I put a copy of the transaction log so we can see exactly what it contains at the time of the failure. If it's a disk failure, then the state of the database is completely empty. We don't have any data whatsoever to deal with. Therefore, we need to restore our backup. And our backup data 
is the original data we started with, where Ray's rate was 0.05, Amy's was 45, Bill was 38, and Carl is 51. We then roll forward or redo all of the transactions that committed. We go to the log file and we look through for any transaction that committed, and then we apply the after image in order to update the data and get us as close to the time of failure as possible. In this example, the only transaction that committed is transaction B. Therefore, we have to change from our backup, we have to change Bill's salary from 38 to 39.9. And this will bring our database up to a state that is as close as possible to the time of failure. What about transaction A and C? They also wrote to the database. They made changes. However, transactions A and C did not commit. Therefore, we ignore those changes. Remember that the durability guarantee only applies to a transaction that has committed. It says if the transaction commits, we're not going to lose your changes. And so here, transaction B committed, so we're not going to lose that change. We can put that new value in place. What if, on the other hand, there was a process failure? In this event, the state of the database is the state of the values at the time of the failure. And if you look here, you can see that at the time of the failure, raise rate was 0.03, Amy's salary was 47.3, Bill's is 39.9, and Carl's is 51. So that will be the state of the database when the database restarts. Because these values were written by uncommitted transactions, they need to be rolled back. So now we're going to do a rollback operation, which is to undo any transaction that didn't commit. So again, we go to the log file, and we notice that transaction C did not commit. Therefore, we're going to put the before image back in place. We'll take the current value of 0.03, and we will put the old value back, 0.05. Now it looks as if transaction C never ran, which is what we want. Also, transaction A did not commit. We don't know whether A was done with its work, or maybe it had even more work to do. We don't know because the database crashed. Therefore, the safe thing to do is to roll back transaction A. So we will take 47.3 that we find on disk, and we'll apply the before image and put a 45 here. In this way again, we have restored the database up to the most current state possible at the time of failure. You may notice that whether we have a disk failure and we restore from the backup, or whether we have a process failure and we roll back, we end up in the same state of the database. 0.05, 45, 39.9, and 51. To summarize, databases can fail due to process or disk failures. The database backup and log, sometimes called a journal, help in the recovery process and help the database uphold the durability property. For disk failure, we restore the database backup and then we roll forward through the log to redo all of the committed transactions. For process failure, we roll backwards through the log and we undo all uncommitted transactions. That's all the material I have for database recovery. As always, additional notes on databases and data warehousing can be found at my website. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.